Welcome to Unit 2, The Media of Art, Lesson 9, Photography. Since the development of photography, the role of the artist has been forever changed. This chapter discusses the discovery of photographic processes from the camera obscura to the digital revolution, as well as photography's significance as an art form and as a vehicle for social change. The objectives for this lesson are to recognize the aesthetic and technical decisions photographers make, Describe early innovations that led to the development of photography. Compare the use of photography as art to its documentary function in society. Explain why artists did not commonly use color photography before the 1970s. Discuss experimental photographic processes used by contemporary artists. And demonstrate the influence of digital technology on photography in the 21st century. In this lesson, we'll also be covering the evolution of photography, photography as an art form, photography and social change, color photography, pushing the limits, the digital revolution. Photography started off as something more practical and functional, more like a tool, and eventually evolved into an art form. We're going to be talking about photography more on the art form side of things. This particular image is by Jane and Louise Wilson. It's The Silence is Twice as Fast Backwards 1 from 2008. It's probably a great image to start off the photography lesson with, with having the light beaming in through the trees. certainly symbolizes the direct meaning or translation of what photography is, and that is light writing. We will now be discussing the evolution of photography from its earliest primitive forms to modern contemporary approaches. The next few slides we'll be going over will be discussing the evolution of the camera obscura. This image here is of a 16th century camera obscura. A camera obscura is translated literally as a dark room. It is the forerunner to modern photography. Renaissance artists used to use these to recreate landscapes. Uh, the idea of photography actually developed out of the fact when there's a small hole in a wall on the opposite wall if there's sunlight passing directly through it there's anything on the outside that the sunlight is passing through and near it will actually reflect through that hole on the opposite side upside down. This is an example of a 17th century portable camera obscura. Having portability certainly allowed the artist to venture out further into the landscape to try to make impressions. As you can see just like in the previous slide that we looked at that light projects through and will cast an image on the opposite side allowing the artist to copy. And finally here's an example of a 17th to 19th century table model camera obscura which certainly took the artists outside of the box allowing them probably a lot more comfort as they were transferring an image. As you see in this one uh, mirrors are now involved when you look at the first original cameras that were being used, they were manufactured out of wood boxes. They basically look like even smaller versions of this. But for a good long time, cameras were inside wood cases, of course, until more industrial materials came out, allowing them to expand the design to make them smaller. This photograph here is by Louis Daguerre. It's from 1839. Daguerre really perfected the photographic process that had been invented in 1826 by Joseph Nietzsche. This particular photograph is the first photograph of a human. Um, what's very interesting about this is that Daguerre actually planned this. If you look in the uh, lower left hand corner, kind of move a little bit towards the center at an angle, you see a guy with his leg up. Uh, he's having his shoe shine, basically. It's not like there weren't other people in the street or other things moving at this time, but in the early days, photography had very long exposure times, 
and anything that was moving basically would move in and out of the image and there wouldn't be any trace of it left only something very still would be uh, kept in a photograph pretty soon photography started taking on the roles of what originally uh, paintings uh, had served which was um, to do landscapes examples of buildings exteriors and portraits of individuals Julia Margaret Cameron was one of the first portraiture artists that worked in photography by this point certainly photography had improved the exposure times weren't as long but they're still just way longer than what we experience nowadays our next several photographs show the evolution of photography as an art form. This photograph is by Alfred Stieglitz. It's of the Flatiron Building from 1903. Stieglitz was at the forefront of photographers wanting themselves to be taken seriously as artists. Also, an individual who is trying to make artists themselves being uh, taken more seriously. In this particular photograph, you can see how there's some visual balance going on between the tree that's up front and the building that's in the back. Things like this usually had to be planned thoroughly in a painting, say like when we look at the uh, work of Degas. He had a lot of asymmetrical balance in his paintings, um, but a lot of planning went into that uh, with a particular image like this. It doesn't mean that the photographer didn't plan, but the time between plan and execution can be fairly instantaneous in photography, and Stieglitz was certainly someone who uh, knew about that. Stieglitz was also responsible for opening the first uh, modern photography gallery in New York. Also, his gallery led to uh, artists like uh, Picasso coming to America. He was really responsible for modern art being taken seriously in America. In this slide, we also have an image by Alfred Stieglitz titled Spring Showers, New York. This is taken in 1901, a little bit earlier than the previous slide. You can also see by comparing the two images that Alfred Stieglitz did have this tendency for balancing his images with the things that were further away and the things that are closer and also relative objects. It was very typical of his style. Talented photographers have to have the sensibility of when exactly the right moment is to snap a picture. This image right here is from Henri Cartier-Bresson from 1932. Bresson certainly had that instinct of when the right moment was to snap a photo. Here we have this man seemingly caught in midair jumping over a puddle. He has a reflection underneath and uh, if you look in the back over on the left there's uh, a series of posters on the wall. There's Raylovsky and Raylovsky and right next to it there's a poster of a dancer. Both of those are also reflected in the uh, water below and the pose of the dancer is certainly similar to the man hopping over the puddle. A painter sometimes would have to plan something like this and work those relationships out ahead of time. Those photographers with that gift notice that instantaneously. This photograph is titled Two Pairs of Legs from Manuel Alvarez Bravo from between 1928 and 1929. This is also a photograph of the moment, so to say, like we saw with Brisson, where the artist is, in a sense, looking around as Bravo did in his urban environments for certain things that may not necessarily go together or that do go together, but that there's some possible irony or relationship when you photograph these things together. As we see here with the pairs of legs that have seemingly no bodies at the top, and the advertisement sign in the top of the image. Also around this time period, the Surrealists were coming to be, so although your text doesn't maybe necessarily mention it, this adventurous approach to photography and also the ironic blending of 
things that possibly don't go together is an aspect of surrealism. Some photographers eventually Photography's ability to be mobile and to instantaneously capture a moment of time and capture the lives of people made it invaluable to social changes across the world over the past 150 years. So in the next several slides we'll be going over, we'll be dealing with photography and social change. This photograph is by Jacob Rees. It is titled Five Cents a Spot unauthorized lodging in a Bayard Street tenement from circa 1890. Photography had already been dealing with documenting uh, war since the 1850s and uh, eventually went off to also uh, deal with the suffering of individuals dealing with hunger and lifestyles of people. Images like this were responsible for bringing to the public how certain people were living it eventually led to stricter housing laws and what uh, landlords were allowed to do. There were also photographs uh, at this time and later of child labor in coal mines which led to laws being passed also for uh, child labor restrictions. This is a photograph by Margaret Bork White titled Louisville Flood Victims from 1938. Margaret Bork White was one of those individuals that did have that sensitivity to uh, capturing the right moment in time. Uh, this photograph couldn't have been planned any better than it was taken. It was of some African Americans standing in a bread line after the Louisville Flood in 1938 in Kentucky. Above them is a giant poster of there is no way like the American way the world's highest standard of living with a white family in the car um, setting up the uh, awareness that there was a big disparity between the lives of white Americans and African Americans. Ansel Adams was trying to bring some awareness to nature conservancy in America with his photographs this photo by Ansel Adams is titled Clearing Winter Storm, Yosemite National Park, California, from 1944. He got really lush photographs by setting up long exposure times when he was taking his images. Gary Brash's photograph, Polar Bear Outside Barrow, Alaska, from 2008, is intended to uh, draw some attention to the warming temperatures in the Arctic areas where polar bears live. So before, just as in now, uh, there are plenty of subjects that artists can try to bring some type of social awareness to through their images. We're going to briefly talk about uh, color photography as a medium. Photography began originally with uh, black and white. This particular photograph we're looking at is from William Eggleston. It's titled Untitled Knee-High Bottle on Car Hood from the Los Alamos portfolio between 1965 and 74 when the photographs were taken. Color photography had been around for a while by uh, this point, but it was black and white photography that was being taken seriously as a artistic medium. Eggleston's intention with his color work here was to create abstract compositions with everyday things. It's not necessarily about the object of the knee-high bottle on the hood. It's more about the relationship between the uh, shapes and the colors of the vehicles and the spaces in between. Also, the color that's in the bottle as well. 
The next few artists we'll be looking at are pushing the limits of photography. Susan Durges does so by taking large sheets of paper coated with a photosensitive emulsion and puts them inside ponds, literally within the water, at night to be exposed to the light coming from the moon and the clouds, also controlling a little bit of the light by shining a flashlight through trees, changing the light. Now remember, this is essentially a long exposure using natural light. This can take quite a long time to render one of these images out. Also, if you look, there's some distortion in the uh, branches and such. Probably not as noticeable in the clouds, but that's coming from the currents in the water that tend to change the way the light is perceived on the paper. This is a really interesting image. It is by Ben Don. It is titled Iridescence of Life number 7 from 2008. This artist created their own method of transferring a photograph onto a leaf. He calls this technique chlorophyll printing and you get the results by taking a photographic image, a leaf, and sandwiching it between uh, panes of glass and leaving it out in the sunlight. A chemical process happens and the image transfers onto the leaf. Here we have a portrait of the artist Bindon and a daguerreotype that he made of Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Remember a daguerreotype is one of the oldest forms of photography so Bindon as a photographer is just as much interested in these older processes which actually can be very dangerous due to the chemicals that they used and some of the modern processes that he experiments with in his other photographs. Artist Zoe Leonard created this postcard installation with 4,000 images on postcards of Niagara Falls. It was titled You See I Am Here After All from 2008. She, as well as other artists, use photographs as artifacts. Works like this become less about the individual photograph itself and more about the relationships that the images set up when they're next to each other, different color groupings, different shape groupings. They all become design elements in the work. With the modern direction of photography going completely digital, artists can really push the envelope beyond what the old-fashioned photography would offer. Uh, Jeff Wall, in this image, Boy Falls from Tree from 2010, takes full advantage of a few aspects. Uh, one of them is the ability to actually blow your photographs up to multiples of different sizes uh, without necessarily a negative to do so, although digital files can vary in size, but he blows them up to sometimes 10 feet square and larger. As we see in this image, is 92 inches by 123 inches. Also, he uses a computer program to edit his photos together. Your text wasn't very specific. I'm an artist who works in Photoshop quite a bit, and that would probably be what I imagine the artists use for this, but there are a few other digital editing programs for photography that you can use. I thought I would leave you with a few images by a uh, artist that works at the university with us. Uh, he's a photography professor named Jamie Baldridge. He's also a close personal friend of mine. Jamie takes photographs and combines them with digital images that he manufactures in the computer uh, with a program called Maya. Um, it's hard sometimes to tell what is artificial and what is real in his images. He takes many, many hours to painstakingly create these fantastical environments that he creates. Thank you for listening.